Talking about drought as part of our series, Museum Mondays, uh, the weather extremes in Sacramento and California history. And I was just saying, we down there, that's the upper end of Lake Natoma, a long, lazy, lightning bolt shaped lake because it is not really a lake. I, I've lived here a few decades and it's only been in the last decade, actually since working at the Sacramento History Museum, uh, that I realized that is the upper branch of the main American River. Dammed at the other end about five, six miles down there by the Nimbus Dam, which is a, a small hydroelectric plant, and the water flows out of Folsom Dam, which we'll show you. We're going to walk and talk the whole time. We're going to try to keep Ellie from getting uh, hit by bicycles as we walk along. We are going to go uphill, so I'm going to go out of breath. The camera could fritz out. Just what I'm telling you is I'm, we're going to provide a lot of comic counterpoint to the dire information that I'm going to tell you about. The, we're in a drought, newsflash. We're in a terrible drought. Uh, this drought has been described as being the worst in a millennia, although we've had several droughts in the last 10 years that sort of match that description. Uh, this current drought has also been described as being very much like the 1976-77 drought. 1977 was, so far, the driest year on record for California. Drought, of course, meaning a lower than expected amount of precipitation over a sustained period. And our goal in this walk is to go up the hill above Folsom Dam, which Ali's showing you now, and maybe show you the low level of Folsom Lake, which is indicative of the flood. Now, I swim down there in Lake Natoma. Uh, it's usually a cold lake. The colder, the better. I love to swim in cold water. And in that sense, I'm kind of like a canary in the coal mine because in the good years, the water gets really cold the lowest the temperature's been that I've swum in here in Lake Natoma is 46. But uh, a good year around mid-January is 48. And then it's, the temperature slowly rises until even by May it's still 53 degrees. That didn't happen this year. It didn't get very cold, maybe 52 at the lowest. And then very quickly, as in about a month, went up to the low 60s. And if I had no other information to go on, just swimming in the lake, I could tell you that we were in a bad weather year. We were in a terrible drought year. The water draws from Folsom Dam, we'll see that better in a bit, draws, they were able to draw that water low from the dam, that cold water, and that water passes down the American River. Partly they have the uh, ability to control the temperatures in Lake Natoma for the fall run Chinook salmon and the steelhead. What do you think, Allie? Should we dare go up this dirt berm? Allie says yes, we're going to do that. But the drought has been so severe in the western United States that, and particularly in the San Joaquin Valley of California, that that water just never got very cold. So I don't know what that does for the, the fish species downstream. At the museum, we talk about the terrible flood of 1861-62. It's kind of like our second origin story after the gold rush, because that flood, that devastating flood that covered the entire state and literally left the state with an inland lake about 300 miles long and as many as 60 miles wide. That did untold damage. And the Sacramento's response, of course, was for the city leaders to require that the central business district of Sacramento be lifted up out of the flood stage. So that changed irrevocably the face of Sacramento and kept it going. What we hardly ever talk about is that after that 61-62 flood was what they call the Great Drought. 62 to 65, a four-year drought. Statewide devastating. The flood and the drought, and by the way, Ali's gonna talk about floods next week. 
The flood and the drought together were a massive one-two punch against what remained of the California, the old time agriculture, the, oh, we'll switch places so you can see the Folsom Dam. I'll watch out for the bicycle, but that devastated the remaining traces of the California cattle ranching industry and transformed the agricultural history of the state because after that, farmers had to figure out ways to get water to where they were growing in the San Joaquin Valley. And that took a long time, but that spawned the impetus for reservoirs and canals to get water to the fertile San Joaquin and Sacramento Valleys. In recorded history, there have been several droughts that did change the course of history. Before the 62-65 drought, there was a drought, a statewide drought in 1841. John Bidwell, who founded the city of Chico, but who was Captain John Sutter's right-hand man in his ranching affairs, talked about how devastating this drought was to the entire state then. He was recording what was going on in the state. Keep in mind, there are only about 200,000 people in the entire state, but they were uh, very badly put out by this drought. Now, that was the time that Captain Sutter was sold Fort Ross, the, the buildings and all the parts of Fort Ross were sold to John Sutter. And he was to pay the Russian American company, the trappers, who ran Fort Ross, he was supposed to pay them in wheat and flour. But his crops failed because of that drought of 1841 and 42. And so the terms of the deal was that the Russia America Company could seize Captain Sutter's New Helvetia grant. Captain Sutter had to compel his son to come from Europe, John Sutter Jr., who along with Peter Burnett, who would later become the first governor of California, to sell off the land he owned that is now Old Sacramento, or Sacramento City, in order to pay off that debt. So it's compelling to think, what if? What if there was no drought? What if he had a good crop year and was able to pay off the Russians the Russians were saying that they knew of the drought for quite a while. They reported that the Slavyanka River, what they call the Russian River, what we call the Russian River, was, was often very dry. So they knew of the drought. There's no such thing as an ideal year in California. It just doesn't happen. By ideal year in the modern age would mean high, heavy snowpack. That snow stays cold for a long time in the mountains, then trickles down to all these reservoirs. And we have a thousand, more than a thousand dams in California. And those reservoirs fill up and they spill out through the riverways and the canals and reach the farmers and the cities. And everyone gets enough. And the groundwater, which is pumped out, refills and recharges and then Rinse, lather, repeat. It happens again the next year and the next year and the next. That doesn't happen in California. We are a Mediterranean climate. Drought and flood are the norm, not the exception. In fact, so we have the 18, let's go, just go through a few uh, droughts. 1841, we already talked about 1862 to 65. In the early part of the 20th century, in fact, from 1917 to 1937 was essentially a 20 year drought. It was broken up by very wet years, a few very wet years. But that longer period, 1917 to 1937, was drought. And that was also the time of the Dust Bowl. And John Steinbeck talks about the migrants from Oklahoma, victims of the Dust Bowl coming to California to try to make a living. But the book really doesn't address that. <laughs> California too was also having 
it's drought problems. There are some differences in California, which I'll address in a bit. But there have been mega droughts too. Even before recorded history, scientific evidence shows that California has been subject to very, very long droughts. How long? Well, scientists have used tree rings and sedimentary data to show that in the year 850, in the early Middle Ages, a drought commenced that lasted for 240 years. And then there was a break. And then in the year 1140, was a drought that lasted 180 years. So I don't know if that pretends something bad for us, but something bad for us doesn't have to be 240 years or 180 years. Uh, scientists are very concerned now, and water watchers are very concerned now, that a flood of even a few more years could have profound effects on California. Even now, with this flood, in this month, the state water control board cut off allotments to farmers from the water system, which includes Folsom Lake and Lake Natoma. No water allotments. Farmers have already had to go to, uh, far, water for farmers is very expensive. They've already had to uh, use and innovate to make the water go farther. I know you probably heard the criticism, well, why do farmers grow almonds? That requires a lot of water. Well, farmers grow almonds because they can sell almonds as a high value crop. They do everything they can in their power to be as efficient as possible with what water they're getting and they're not getting that much water. And the problems cascade when they don't get any water. They, they try to dig and, and pump water out of the ground. And they have to dig deeper and deeper because these prolonged droughts have caused them to go deeper and deeper. And that's just drained the aquifers, the underground systems of porous rock that hold the water. And in some cases, those aquifers have collapsed. And the land in parts of the San Joaquin Valley have dropped because of these collapses. And then, of course, the farm labor goes because you the farmers have to fallow land i'm going to hold this for you there Alan. they have to fallow land and of course they have to let farmers go because there's less land to grow and then of course the waters the soil is very dry and the vegetation is very dry and fires start almost every year and they become devastating because it is very dry the city of mendocino which relies on pumps among its town, they have to ship in water. The nearby city of Fort Bragg has bought a, an emergency desalination plant. The uh, Oroville, as I said, shut off its hydroelectric plant for the first time since it's opened in 1967. So it's putting more pressure on the power. So the droughts have this cascading of effect and the state has to figure out what to do about it. I guess that one glimmer of hope was another drought that changed the course of history, and I mentioned it. It's the 1976-77 drought, the driest in history. That did two things. Changed the course of history in two interesting, surprising ways. One, it got Californians thinking about conserving water and drip irrigation and those kind of innovations kind of came out of that. There are new neighborhoods, especially in the coastal parts of California and Southern California that have to use xeriscaping, no lawns, because this is a Mediterranean climate, they have to use drip irrigation. Uh, I don't know if you remember, you were here in California in 1976, 77, you probably remember the phrase, if it's yellow, let it mellow, if it's brown, flush it down. So. There was very much an ethic about, we are all in this together to conserve the water. The other thing that happened in the real light of the 1976-77 drought, exemplified by my two neighbor friends when I was growing up, Steve and Dave, brothers, lived at the only house that had a swimming pool on our block. And because of the drought, 
their dad drained the pool, just like all the pools in California seem to be drained, just about the time that the sport of skateboarding became, was revived, and these pools suddenly became bulls to innovate new skateboarding moves, and skateboarding's never really lost its luster since, it was even in the Olympics in Tokyo, I believe. So we've learned our lesson, or we think we have, we've kind of gotten complacent, but there's a lot of lesson to be learned because scientists are debating whether this is part of a mega drought. I mean, you can argue that this drought has been going on since the very late part of 2011, broken only by maybe a year or two uh, by, by storm. The 2017 storm was very, very wet. In fact, we had someone on tour, a water, a hydrologist, who said that the conditions of the 2017 flood year were very, very similar to the devastating 1862 flood year. In other words, a heavy snowpack, cold snowpack, followed immediately by warm rains which caused the water to go too far down, the, too fast, and cause the flooding. Now, if it weren't for modern flood control measures in place, then Sacramento and other parts of the state might have been damaged a lot more. But there are measures, in fact, this is one of them. First of all, Folsom Dam was raised slightly in 2017 to catch more water should the day come when there's more water to catch and then they built this new spillway and you can see these steps almost like an amphitheater and those are riffles so that when water has to be released from the spillway in a hurry such as in a flood then the riffles will deaden the uh, turbulence of the flow so when it goes into the upper reaches of Lake Natoma, which again is the trunk of the American River, the main trunk of the American River, uh, the damages downstream won't be quite as bad. But uh, Colorado River cut off water to farmers, and that's what's, that's what's going to happen if these floods persist, is that agriculture gets hit first. Which is, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it makes sense, it doesn't sound fair, but the water gets cut off and, and that hurts California because it's a $50 billion industry in California. California grows, uh, is number one in the production of many crops and the economy suffers as a result. But in the end, experts say if the droughts persist, the water will be saved for cities before farmers. Uh, of course, you, the, it's a very complicated water picture in California because the government water managers have to uh, uh, attend to city water, agriculture. They have to have the water sufficient for downstream species. And like this one and like a lot of the dams, they, these Folsom provides hydroelectric power. And it's still able to do that. There's still water flowing through the dam. It's just the water, just the lake is very low. The lake is about less than a third of its average right now. Folsom Dam is not the biggest dam by far. Folsom Dam can hold about 975,000 acre feet of water. Imagine a box of water that's an acre that way and that way and then a foot deep. That's just less than a third the size of the Oroville Dam and less than a quarter of the size of the biggest, which is the Shasta Dam. The Shasta Dam holds up waters from the Sacramento, Pitt, and McLeod Rivers. Oroville holds the waters from the Feather River and Folsom Dam. Again, this is something I didn't understand until the last decade. Hold back the waters of the Three Forks of the American River. And we might make it. We might make it to the top. That's been our goal. Well, it's only been 21 <laughs> Bear with us for four minutes. We're going to go up to the top because I'm going to show you the direction of communities that have been exposed after all these years. This dam was built in 1955, completed and operational in 1956.
but because it was built in 1955, it had some effect in mitigating the devastating effects of the 1955 flood here in Northern California. But in building this dam, just like any other reservoir, there's communities down there and they had to be destroyed. One of those communities was Mormon Island, historic uh, for many reasons. It was created by members of the Mormon Battalion who were organized by Brigham Young of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to fight in the U.S.-Mexican War. The war ended, they were mustered out. Brigham Young told them to stay in California, find some work, and then once you gathered up money, join him where he has settled the church in Salt Lake. And so they created a town here on the South Fork of the American River. It's called Mormon Island because it was surrounded on three sides by the South Fork of the American River. And the town cut a channel behind the town. So it was basically its own artificial island. We've been hearing reports that Mormon Island has been exposed by the drought. But Mormon Island is very close to the base of the dam here. And so it would have to be a very, very dire drought to see Mormon Island. What the new town that's being exposed now is called Red Bank. And Red Bank, some of the ruins look like walled roads. And those are in fact the um, of the ditches created by the Natoma Water and Mining Company, the early attempts to bring water to farmers. And that's California's problem. Let's come over here. So Allie still hasn't been killed yet by the car. So I want to keep that record going. The basic problem for California is that the fertile soil and the water don't meet. So the water has to be brought to the fertile soil. And so especially, well, Indians, California Indians, particularly in Southern California, they were digging ditches and culverts to get water from water sources to their agriculture. They were planting into wetted, naturally wetted soils. The Spanish missions were making culverts and aqueducts and cisterns to bring water to their planted agriculture. The Mexican government who took over the Spanish missions, they continued to do the same. Miners were digging ditches to get water to and away from what they were doing, including building flumes high up the mountains to bring water so that it could be brought at high pressure uh, through hoses in the hydraulic mining. That water was very, very precious to them and could be sold to agriculture. They just didn't want to do that. It was like a low value endeavor because Mining ruled in California, but the hydraulic mining caused so much damage to the potential farmland in the valleys that finally by 1884, the Sawyer decision outlawed the destruction caused by hydraulic mining down into the streams and agriculture took precedence. And now those ditches that the miners had dug became very useful for the farmers to divert water. And the San Joaquin Valley grows what it grows because of a system of reservoirs all along the Sierra that catch the water and deliver it by canal to, to, the, to the valley. And I think it's a fair statement to say that you and I probably couldn't even live in California were it not for this system of water delivery. It has changed the landscape of California forever and will continue to do it. But without these, we wouldn't be able to live here. And uh, my mouth's going dry, so I'm wondering if we're going to be able to live here soon. I, we have, do you think we should make it? Do you think we should go? We're almost there. We're almost there, and I can, we can just end by showing you the sunken lake. Thanks for staying with us so far. Any questions? Things I've said wrong?
I hope this is not a historic drought, but it's if I was king of California, I would say, let's, let's just establish that this is probably more like what's gonna go on in the future. So we can't just ke keep dreaming, we gotta do something about it. Now, you California voters, you and I, passed a bond in 2014, Proposition 1, seven and a half billion dollars for more water recovery. So what's going on with that? Well, there's a big reservoir that should go in west of Calusa called the Sites Reservoir. With those big projects like this, and you can see a good sweep of Folsom down here. You can imagine they take forever to get approved. They take forever to build. And as they take forever to get the financing, the project gets more expensive. The project managers have to scale back. So the site's reservoir is not being built, at least not yet. They're getting more luck with smaller projects. One is to recharge the groundwater, put water back into the ground and use treated wastewater, just gray water or even worse, but it's going to be treated sufficiently that it can be drunk and it's going to restore the groundwater to be reused later. That's what's important is those groundwater supplies have been sorely depleted. Another is what's been going on in the Southern California because they're, they're not quite boasting, but they are saying we don't have quite the problems that you in Northern California have. They have the groundwater recharge in some places. They have water sources from other places like the Colorado, the Owens Valley, and they have desalination plants. I think it's Costa Mesa that has a large one. Desalination, taking seawater, taking the salt out of it so it can be drunk is really, really expensive. Five times more than what fresh water costs consumers. But maybe it's the way that it has to go. Uh, there's so much water out there in the ocean. Maybe, maybe we need to do something about it. I don't know the solution. California is a very complicated place. There are 4,000 entities in California that have what they call first in time, first in right water rights. So they have ownership of key parts of the water sources. And does the world change such that they give up or renegotiate their water rights? I don't know. It's very complicated. And I've vamped quite a lot and we, we're almost there. We're almost to the top. I think maybe I'll switch with Hallie and she can show the last of the dam while we're walking. But I'll show you where Red Bank is and where Mormon Island should be. I invite you to come down to Folsom Lake and walk around the dry lake bed and look at the foundations of old houses down here. I also strongly encourage you to get your kayak or canoe or find somebody who has a kayak and canoe and take you into Upper Natoma, my favorite, one of my favorite places in the world. The Granite Canyon is so tranquil and great blue herons will just stand on the ledges and look down on you as you paddle by and mergansers will swim by. Lovely, the females have beautiful cinnamon tails on their heads and they, they're diving ducks, so it's kind of fun to watch three dozen of these ducks all dive into the cold water on some kind of signal. All right, we've reached the mountaintop and very close, the big reveal of Lake Natoma, or what is left of it, I still got breath in my lungs. Allie's arms are going to fall off because she's been holding this gimbal in her right hand and being blown about by the umbrella in her left hand. All for you. All for the sake of this production and for the camera. And the camera hasn't fritzed out. And I assume you can hear me. And you win an award just for sticking with us.
you're probably sweating right along with us. Well, with me, Allie's just glowing. I am sweating. Oh, that is a great question. What road are we walking? This is the new Folsom Crossing Road. Thank you very much. I should have pointed that out. So we started out on the other side. We went under the new Folsom Crossing Road and we're heading into Folsom. So where we started was right at the nexus of a lot of historic uh, gold mining places. Uh, Negro Bar is where I swim. Negro Bar is on the south edge of the American River, about a mile and a half down from where we started, named for black miners who mined there, and that's now the western edge of the city of Folsom. Mississippi Bar was inland somewhat. Another gold mine encampment, and of course Mormon Island. And I didn't point out the most obvious thing across the river from where we started, which is Folsom Prison. I'm not allowed to swim all the way up to Folsom Prison, there's a chain stretched across the uh, narrow waterway at that point with a sign saying, don't go any further. So, here we are. We've made it. And after all that, it doesn't look all that low, but yeah, it's low. It's very low. Let's see where we can point out Red Bank. We'll go over here. Any other questions? Thanks for asking that question. Thanks for calling out things I forgot to tell you. So Red Bank should be due south, so it's kind of just beyond that point that's starting to be exposed and the dry land, that should be Red Bank. So yeah, we're at Ollie's Pointing and there's a couple of snowy egrets down there taking advantage of the shallow. And the Mormon Island is more out here, uh, I think that's uh, easterly, southeasterly and under very deep water. So Mormon Island itself, neighboring parts of Mormon Island have been exposed, but my understanding is that Mormon Island itself has not been exposed. So you've made it. I think we've broken records that the museum will not want to be met again, a very long Museum Monday uh, while we talked, but uh, that was our goal, somehow see if we can climb this hill. It turns out to be way farther away than I thought it would and I, we're going to have to do an armectomy for Allie when we get back. She's going to get bionic, bionic arms. Uh, so thank you very much. Next week, Allie, if she does have arms to lift with and gesture with, we'll do a probably a shorter Museum Monday about uh, floods. Not that she could fill a half an hour of floods. There's a lot of flood stories, but thank you very much. That'll do it from us. We're going to go find something cold to drink and shade to stand in. Bye, everyone.